All right, I think we can get started. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, so very much appreciate you being here. Um, we'll get to introductions in just a moment, but I did want to kick things off with just some housekeeping uh, to let everybody know what you can expect um, from the webinar this evening. Um, we will uh, talk with you very briefly about Progressive Turnout Project, your host for the webinar this evening. Uh, we'll explain our turnout grants program. Uh, you will, of course, hear from our special guests. Um, we're so excited to have uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes of Wisconsin, um, also a Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate. Um, he'll be joining us as well as Cecilia Gonzalez, Nevada Assemblywoman. And then we'll have a panel discussion um, featuring some of the folks and the organizations that have been doing really incredible work this cycle and continue to do really good work this cycle. And they are recipients of our turnout grants program. If you do have questions, please use the Q&A. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the chat, but the Q&A is really the best uh, place for you to ask any questions that you may have. Um, my colleague Kristen is going to be monitoring that. You can also always email us if your question does not get answered. Uh, Kristen will do her best to get after all of your questions, but we do have more than 150 people here tonight, so um, it could get a little busy. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just say that we are recording this um, and we'd be happy to um, share the slides to anybody that would, would specifically like to see them. We'll also be sending out a recap afterwards. So to get things started, um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Cindy Hamilton. Um, I'm with Progressive Turnout Project. I mentioned my colleague, Kristen, um, who's here as well, um, helping to man the show on the Q&A side. And then Emily, I know, love to have you introduce yourself as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Emily Cowie. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Turnout Grants Grant Manager for Progressive Turnout Project, and I'm so happy to welcome our, our grantees and special guests tonight. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, so tonight we do have our special guests um, and several special guests, as I mentioned. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, Mr. Barnes is running just a little bit late. That sometimes happens um, with campaigns and candidates as we get closer to Election Day, the Wisconsin primary. Um, it's just around the corner on August 9th. So we're going to go ahead and just move forward in the presentation. I'll tell you a little bit, as I mentioned, something about um, Progressive Turnout Project and the work that we do. And then as soon as Mr. Barnes joins us, which really should be any minute, um, I'll stop talking and introduce him, and then we'll have a, a quick Q&A with him. So thank you so much for your patience. Um, but as I mentioned, this is Progressive Turnout Project. We are honored to host this webinar. We're just so excited to have all of you here with us. We have almost 200 people here. Um, and the best way to really describe the work that we do here at Progressive Turnout Project is to start with our mission. Um, and you can read it here, but I'll go ahead and read it to you again. Uh, we are dedicated to mobilizing the Democratic Party and defending democracy. Our voter turnout initiatives are solely focused on motivating Democrats to exercise their right to vote. And we actually have a very brief snippet of a video on the next slide, which will also help explain the work that we do. We are Progressive Turnout Project. Our mission? Rally Democrats to vote. Progressive Turnout Project started in 2015 to fill a void in Democratic politics. Too few research-backed strategies to talk directly with voters and too much money pouring into inefficient TV ads. Since then, we've made more than 59 million voter contact attempts, helping more than 100 Democrats win up and down the ballot. We are building even more ambitious programs for the 2022 midterms with thousands of team members and thousands more volunteers reaching voters through four overlapping and complementary programs. Distributed organizing, relational organizing, campaign fellows, and postcards to swing states. We know how much is at stake in 2022. And with multiple voter contact programs approaching different groups using different methods, we are leaving no stone unturned to reach the infrequent Democratic voters we need to win. 
Great. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, and as promised, uh, we do have our special guest um, here with us this evening. So thank you again, everybody, for your patience. Um, I do want to just introduce um, Mr. Barnes uh, just for a moment, and then I'll go ahead and stop talking. Um, we are just so honored um, to be joined by Madela Barnes tonight. I will quickly say Lieutenant Governor Barnes serves as Wisconsin's 45th Lieutenant Governor. Um, he was elected on November 8th in 2018, and he is the first African-American to serve as a Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin and the second African-American to ever hold statewide office. In 2012, at the age of 25, Lieutenant Governor Barnes was elected to the Wisconsin State Assembly, where he served two terms. His time in the State Assembly included serving as chair of the legislature's Black and Latino Caucus and becoming a recognized leader on progressive economic policies and gun violence prevention legislation. Mr. Barnes is now running as a 2022 Democratic U.S. Senate candidate to represent Wisconsin. He's on the ballot in Wisconsin's August 9th Democratic primary, and that's right around the corner. And as I mentioned, we are so proud to not only have Mr. Barnes with us here tonight, but also to be um, a partner of Mr. Barnes. We're so proud to endorse him from Progressive Turnout Project, especially now there's been um, so many pieces of good news coming uh, towards him and towards his campaign in the last few days and these last final days as we get closer to the primary. So it's really good timing. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll go ahead and stop talking, let you introduce yourself as well, and then we can move into our brief Q&A. Absolutely. Well, just want to say thank you so much for having me. Really excited to have the invitation. Again, I'm Mandela Barnes, proudly serving as Lieutenant Governor, State of Wisconsin, uh, and I'm now running for the United States Senate. I want to thank the Progressive Turnout Project for your support and all the hard work you do day in and day out. I am really, uh, really excited to be in this race. We have seen an incredible surge in momentum just this week alone. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful to have the grassroots operation, the grassroots support, the grassroots donors, and the grassroots activists that we have that are making this campaign possible. It was a very crowded field when we first started. Uh, eventually, eight candidates uh, made it to the ballot, and two this week alone have stepped aside and supported me in this effort. And the two that stepped aside were two of the top four candidates. I'm incredibly grateful to have their support in our effort to expand the majority uh, for Democrats in the US Senate this November. So with that being said, just wanna thank you all for having me. And I'm really excited to hop into the Q&A portion. Wonderful. So I guess the first question is, you alluded to this a little bit, but um, how are you and your team feeling? You know, these are the last final days. How are you feeling ahead of the primary? 13 days into the primary, <laughs> feeling really good. Uh, just this Monday, um, one of, uh, like I said, one of the top four candidates, Tom Nelson, uh, decided to suspend his campaign and endorse me. Uh, I've known Tom Nelson for a number of years now, back when I was in the state assembly. And uh, just today, uh, Alex Lazary, who was polling in second, who was actually starting to close the gap a little bit, uh, he suspended his campaign today and endorsed me. I'm incredibly, I'm really excited because it shows the momentum that we've had since we launched this campaign. Uh, but to see it all come together in this moment and this show of solidarity, looking at the bigger picture, uh, gives me uh, so much, gives me so much more uh, hope, gives me so much more enthusiasm. Uh, it honestly is so encouraging to have the, their support and to have this strength, not just going into the primary, but going into November. Uh, we still don't take anything for granted. This is about building a grassroots coalition to not just beat Ron Johnson, but to outlast this entire election cycle, because uh, too often we see campaigns come in and out and we lose all that infrastructure. I want to make sure that we have it in place, not just for this race, but also for 2024. I know that you got your start as a community organizer. Uh, can you talk a bit about what organizing means to you? Well, absolutely. I still try to think of myself in, as an organizer in many ways. Uh, my path here is different than many others. I don't come from a wealthy family. I don't come from a politically connected family. I saw things going on in my community and I wanted to fix them. 
And it was in 2004 when I heard Barack Obama's DNC speech. I was inspired. I was encouraged. I felt like the things around me could change if I worked hard enough. And that's what pushed me into organizing. I initially became a field organizer in 2008 on a congressional race in Louisiana. And I moved on from there to take on community-based organizing right in the heart of the city of Milwaukee, taking on some of our toughest challenges, jobs and economic development, uh, public education, immigration reform, and treatment instead of prison, issues that uh, didn't get the attention that they deserved from our elected leaders. And I thought to myself, well, you know, this is a job I felt I could do better. And I had the choice to either get mad or get elected. So I ran and I won with a broad base of support of people from all over and all different communities across the district, all across the city, uh, many people all across the state. And I've worked to maintain and grow those relationships ever since that election. And it's the reason why I'm here today. If I was never involved in the work of organizing, I wouldn't be serving as lieutenant governor. I wouldn't have a chance to even consider running for the U.S. Senate in, in, in any serious way. You can probably relate to this next question based on what you just shared about your background as an organizer. Um, a lot of the folks on this call are volunteers, they're supporters, they're organizers themselves, and they want to make a real difference. And we recognize that it can sometimes feel overwhelming. Um, so wondering what your advice may be. How do you stay motivated? How do you feel like your actions can bring about progressive change? Absolutely. I stay motivated um, just thinking about the things that are happening around me, remembering that better is possible and bad things happen when good people don't show up. And the only way that good things happen is when regular people step up to do extraordinary things and no person does extraordinary things on their own. And as tough and challenging as things may get, I am constantly reminded that this work is so much bigger than me. And the fact that there are so many people who are counting on us to get this right, so we better get it right. And that's, uh, I think that's what keeps me motivated. And knowing that there were so many people who came before me that laid the foundation that made it somewhat easier for me to be involved in this space. Thank you so much for sharing that. We know you are very busy, so we don't have any more questions for you, but we do have one last point that we would love to have you share with us. Uh, can you let us know the best way for the folks on this call to support you and your campaign? We'll go ahead and include in the chat a link to your website, but anything else you'd like us to know? Absolutely. I just realized my name was Corey Kozlowski out here for a long time. But um, <laughs> you can, uh, we know who you are. You can go to the website. It's MandelaBarnes.com. And we would love to have you sign up to volunteer. Uh, you can donate and you can spread the word. And you can follow us on social media also. Uh, my handles are the other Mandela. That is on Twitter, that is on it's Twitter, it's on Twitter, it's on Instagram, and uh, apparently I'm on TikTok, but that's a, that's a project of our social media team. I'm, I'm not personally invested <laughs> in. <laughs> it's very smart for you to be there, and I'm sure that you'll yeah. get a lot more followers yeah. after tonight. Um, so thank you for sharing your handles. Um, we'll make sure to put those in the chat as well in addition to your website. And we are just so proud to be among your many supporters at Progressive Turnout Project. We're so proud to endorse you and are so grateful to have you join us tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time. Well, I'm so grateful for your support and I'm ready to uh, take on this next challenge with you all. Good, we are ready to support you through the finish line and best of luck over the coming days. Thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we will go back to our presentation. Thank you, Emily, for adding that. So I did share our mission statement um, and you did watch the video. Um, what I'd like you to know is when I shared our mission statement, I was lots of fancy words, uh, but it really does speak to everything we do here at Progressive Turnout Project. Every day we plan for and execute on proven tactics and trusted methodologies and these turn out inconsistent Democrats. So these are the folks who don't always turn out to vote, but when they do, they are very likely to vote for Democrats on the ballot. 
And what is important to know, thank you for skipping through that, since we already did watch it, um, is that we do this work with the help of grassroots funding, uh, with donations from people like you. So we have more than 2 million individuals who provide an average donation of under $20. Um, and this is what powers us. Um, we are the largest voter contact organization in the country, and we're able to execute programs across the United States because of the support of our grassroots donors. So we will share our donation link in the chat. Um, if you would like to be one of those 2 million folks, um, we're always so grateful to everybody who um, provides not only these small financial gifts, but also their time. Uh, we know a lot of our postcard volunteers um, kindly um, invest in buying stamps for our postcards. And we absolutely appreciate really everything, whether it's time um, or it is donation. So thank you again for all of your support today. And again, just a reminder, you know, I talked about those um, inconsistent Democratic voters. When we talk about our work, when we talk about um, what these donations power, these are the one on one conversations. Um, so we're knocking on doors, we're connecting with folks through other methods, and we are sending postcards. And so that can be seen most clearly through two more numbers for you. Um, in the midterms, we plan to contact more than 6 million Democrats. Um, we'll have messages and tactics that are laser focused on voting plans, voting information, uh, and we'll be talking about how voting can make a real difference in someone's community. And we'll do this, another number, by hiring up to 10,000 voter contact experts. Uh, this will be across the country. Um, our largest investment and what is a priority for us is rallying Democrats to vote in Wisconsin and then the six other states. Uh, Mr. Barnes talked about expanding our Democratic majority in the U.S. Senate, and that absolutely is a priority for us as well. So in addition to Wisconsin, you'll see us um, really focusing on New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Nevada, and Arizona. Uh, but beyond that, it's not just limited to these seven states. Through our fellows programs, through other initiatives like postcards, like I mentioned, um, we'll engage, we'll We'll target federal, we'll target other key state level legislative races, and these will be in states from California to South Carolina. Um, if you have questions about in what states we'll be executing our tactics, you can certainly email us. Um, you can also check out our website as well, and we'll make sure that those links are in the chat. Um, and then just briefly to talk about those tactics uh, before we move on to the rest of our program this evening, um, I did just wanna give you a snapshot of our portfolio. Uh, this is what we will be doing uh, to rally Democrats to vote. Um, some of this was teased in that short video that we watched. And then um, once again, I'll stop talking and then I will uh, pass the presentation along to Emily, um, who will talk about turnout grants. Um, so just starting with the campaign fellows. Uh, so this is empowering campaigns, uh, both federal campaigns, as well as those key state level campaigns that often don't have the capacity, don't have the bandwidth, don't have the financial ability to bring on a staffer that can really be focused on direct voter contact. And so our campaign fellows program embeds somebody on these campaigns in those key final weeks um, before election day, really focused on talking with inconsistent Democratic voters and knocking on doors. Distributed organizing is a new innovation for us this cycle. Um, this is looking at rural and exurban communities that um, sometimes, unfortunately, are not targeted by campaigns for a host of reasons. Um, this is empowering activists, organizers, regular folks in these uh, neighborhoods, in these communities, providing them with uh, voter files, with scripts, all the tools that they need um, to go and talk with their, their neighbors about voting um, and knock on doors. And then we do uh, pay these folks as well. Community mobilizers, you may have heard the term relational organizing. Um, this is based on the idea that the most impactful message to encourage someone to vote can come from a friend or a family member, a trusted messenger. And so what we'll be doing through our community mobilizers program, um, looking at mostly urban areas, is uh, paying folks to look at their friends and family, to look at their networks and talk with them. Um, about voting, uh, again, using tools that we will provide them and lots of training. Uh, distributed organizing will look to hire, um, it should be around up to 4,200 folks and then community mobilizers, we're looking to hire 
um, up to 4,500. Um, so this is uh, quite a, an expansive program for us and one that we're excited to share more details on in the coming weeks. Postcards, the swing states I mentioned, um, a lot of you may be here uh, from that program. Um, this is an army of volunteers sending handwritten postcards to uh, voters across the country. Um, we just finished sending millions of postcards to uh, voters in those key seven um, Senate states that I mentioned earlier. We still have programs available if you're interested in writing postcards. We're now looking at um, some smaller programs, but really impactful, innovative programs, again, based on um, that idea of uh, talking with folks within your own community. And so we have a neighborhood letters program, and then we also will be rolling out more postcards um, for competitive house districts. So stay tuned for more information there. Uh, we'll have those details up on our website. Uh, so turnout grants, I don't want to go into too much detail because Emily will talk briefly about that before we hear from um, our other special guests. Um, but just briefly, I can tell you that the thinking here around turnout grants is providing um, early funding, which can be really important to grassroots organizations at this point in the cycle and allowing them to scale up um, with plenty of time as we all uh, hurdle towards election day. So with that, I will pass it along to Emily, who will talk a little bit more about turnout grants, and then we'll engage in conversation with our wonderful organization. Thank you, Cindy. Um, yes, I'm so excited to talk more about the Turnout Grants Program. Uh, Progressive Turnout Project launched uh, the grants in January of 2022, and this program allows um, PTP to directly support grassroots organizations that are doing innovative and important work this cycle. For many organizations, getting critical early funding is often a challenge, as Cindy said, and Turnout Grants fills an important funding gap. Um, for, for many orgs. PTP's financial support to these organizations help them grow and thrive while complementing PTP's own voter contact work, ensuring that we build any gaps that may exist between our voter contact programs and other inconsistent democratic voters across different demographics. So over 205 organizations submitted applications uh, for our inaugural cycle, uh, which closed in May 2022. And we selected nine innovative organizations who are doing important work within key states. You're going to hear from four of these amazing organizations tonight and learn more about the creative ways that they're connecting with voters this cycle and beyond. Um, but before I introduce them, I'm going to introduce um, our other special guest, uh, Cecilia Gonzalez. Um, Cecilia is a Nevada State Assemblywoman and also a member of Progressive Turnout Project's Fellow Advisory Board, which is um, a fantastic program you heard C uh, Cindy mention above. But um, Cecilia, I'll turn it over to you to do a quick introduction about yourself and tell us a little bit about how your campaign is going this season. Yes, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Cecilia Gonzalez, and I represent Assembly District 16 in Nevada. And a little bit about myself, I grew up in Nevada, and I am um, primarily Nevada educated. I went to K through 12 school, and all of my degrees are from um, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I'm currently obtaining my um, doctoral degree in multicultural education. I teach as a part-time instructor at the university, and I also teach in K through 12. Um, primarily el elementary schools is um, what I love to teach the most. And so if you haven't got, gathered it by now, I'm very passionate about teaching and education and making sure that um, you know education deeply changed my life. And that's something that I wanna protect in our state and why I ran for office. Uh, my election this cycle is going, um, I kind of felt like I was running for office again for the first time because we redistrict our state. And then on top of that, my district um, changed over 50%, probably like 75%, 80%. So I felt like I was running again for the first time. Um, and then I also had a challenger to my seat. Um, so that was definitely nerve wracking as we share primaries. Um, we love and hate them. Um, and so, yeah, I will kick it back to you to ask questions, I think it is at this point. 
Yes, we're going to also first introduce our um, other grantees quickly, and then we'll go into questions for everyone. Um, so let me first turn it over to Mohan for our first introduction. Hey there, my name is Mohan Zeshadri. I'm the executive director of APIPA, the Asian Pacific Islander Political Alliance. We're Pennsylvania's first and only statewide Asian American political organization. And we work year round to build long-term power in uh, Asian communities across the Commonwealth. We were first founded uh, a couple of years back for, by a coalition of Asian 501c3 nonprofits across the state to ensure that our communities were turning out against Donald Trump in the 2020 election. And we were successful in that election in doubling Asian American turnout and signing up 50% of our community to vote by mail providing half of President Biden's margin of victory in Pennsylvania in 2020. And then since then, uh, we've worked to you know, be the statewide uh, electoral organization for our community, the statewide legislative and policy vehicle for our communities, uh, the political home for our people across the state. And we do it all in 15 different languages to ensure that we're meeting our people where we're at. So excited to spend this time talking about our Language Access Center and the work we're gonna do this year to make sure that Pennsylvania once again goes blue. I'll turn it over to Erica and Cassie. Thank you so much. Um, I can go first and then I'll pass it to Cassie. Um, my name is Erika Castro. My pronouns are she, they. Um, I've been with PLAN for almost seven years now. Um, I specifically focus on our C3 side, which was founded in 2006 um, by local activists really wanting to make sure that we could build collective power and make Nevada a just state for everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status, their immigration status, but we knew that collective power was going to be the way that we could win um, policies. But then we also wanted to make sure that we were also involved in electoral work. Um, so I'll pass it over to Cassie so she can share a little bit about that. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Cassie Charles, the campaign director here with Plan Action. Um, I started with Plan just over a year ago, um, and we're trying a lot of new innovative ways to engage our community this year um, through electoral work. Um, you know, we have a lot of expansions into different um, um, housing facilities that we've never contacted before or or have never contacted in this way before, um, as well as um, moving into rural communities. Um, so we um, are excited to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but that is Plan Action. Cynthia, I'll pass it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Emily. Good evening. Thank you to Progressive Turnout Project for your great work and support. I'm Cynthia Wallace, Executive Director of the New Rural Project, born and raised rural, but not in North Carolina, but in Georgia. Um, Helen Probst Mills, who's also on um, this call tonight, and I co-founded our organization after we both ran for office in 2020 in overlapping counties in the old 9th Congressional District. Post that election, when we didn't get the results that we would have wanted, we really continue to talk. And our concern for rural folks centered around those folks whose voices were muted. And the data that showed while 2020 made history and voter turnout for some, it wasn't historic for voters of color. That resulted in 60,000 black, brown and indigenous registered voters not going to the polls in just our seven rural counties. And there's a race of out of 5 million casts for the Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court, that was decided in 2020 by 401 votes. So when you look at those voters who didn't vote, the fact that Black male registered voters in our rural counties had a 35 to 40% voter turnout rate, we know there's so much work to do. And to do that work, our organization will talk a little bit more about it though, but we launched community events and provided essential services with trusted partners, taking the GOTV and turning that V from vote to get out the vaccine, making knocking on doors, making phone calls, and really getting shots in arms to those folks who've been historically marginalized who are also not civic engaged. So looking forward to talking a little bit more about that work um, as uh, we move forward this evening. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Miss Afoy. I'm the chair of the Navajo County Democrats as well as the field director for Northeast Arizona Native Democrats. 
Thanks to all of you for spending some time with us this evening. And thank you so much to the Progressive Turnout Project for making our Family Votes program a reality. Um, we have been organizing year round in sovereign land in Northeast Arizona since 2018. We have a ton of voters who are typically called infrequent voters. There are high potential voters. These are the folks who we know we can get to the polls to help build a margin of victory for Democrats in Arizona. In 2020, Joe Biden won by four votes per precinct in the state. And we're so proud to say that the increase in voters on sovereign lands in our communities was more than Joe Biden's entire margin of victory. This work um, started because we saw that the Democratic Party infrastructure hadn't been heavily invested in these communities, and we, as part of the Democratic Party, wanted to change that. So um, we use vote tripling and relational organizing to make sure that we reach out to every voter in these very rural and remote communities to get them to the polls in November. I'm going to turn it over to our founding organizer, Lorraine Coyne. Hey, good evening. Can you see me? Yes, Lorraine. Okay. Um, that means good evening in Hopi. My name's Lorraine Coyne, and I'm also um, a worker with um, the Northeast Arizona Democratic Party. I'm with the um, Family Votes Matriarch Program here on Hopi. Um, I think, you know, we started this program because it was so important for the matriarch um, of our families here on Hopi to be the ones to go out and uh, recruit, especially our younger generation. Um, I know that um, a lot of um, our Hopi people uh, weren't going out to vote, but um, in 20 20 when um, the elections were being held, we had a big turnout. Um, and that was so great because, um, you know, Hopi is not really involved in politics, but we wanted to see a change. So we all went out and we um, brought in uh, President Biden, which was a big success. So I, you know, we have our matriarch program going out there, spreading the words not only to the youth but also to our elders and people that don't go out very often out into the communities. We're having rallies to educate people to help them register to vote and also to update their voter registrations. So I think, um, in, you know, we made a lot of progress, not only here on Hopi, but also our surrounding um, Indian communities like the Dine Nation, which is the Navajo Nation, and also the Apache tribe. So, you know, we're all working together and getting out and talking among our people. And one of the things that I always emphasize to my kids is I talk to them during um, if, even if we're having breakfast, lunch, or dinner, we put aside all our electronics and we listen. And they listen to me when I talk to them because who doesn't listen to a mom, right? Or a grandma. So I talked to them about the importance of voting because I was never educated on this when I you know, was going growing up. I grew up very traditionally, that's why. So I um, talked to my kids, my grandkids, and now they're going out and spreading the word. I have an 11 year old granddaughter, great granddaughter that registered to vote when she was eight years old. I still have her registration. She always reminds me, grandma, we're Democrats, right? Right. So I'm gonna have her um, redo her registration when she's old enough and you know, go from there and hopefully we'll get more Native people to vote. Thank you, Asquale. Thank you so much everyone for introducing yourselves. I'm so excited to get into our conversation now. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing so that we'll be better able to see each other while I ask these questions. Um, Mohan, I'm gonna start with you. Um, 
how did you and the APIPA identify the need for your new, unique and new program, the Language Access Center? Sure. So, you know, a, a thing to know about Pennsylvania is Asian American communities is 78% of Asians in Pennsylvania speak a language other than English at home. And that means that even despite all of the barriers our government puts in place when it comes to becoming a citizen and becoming a voter, um, you know, you, it is very hard to do that, obviously, if you don't speak any English. That doesn't mean that you're comfortable in this language. That doesn't mean you're going to open up and have an organizing conversation in this language. And we know that because the organizations that founded us have spent collectively the last uh, 75 years building base and power in Chinese and Korean and Filipino and Vietnamese communities all across Pennsylvania. And what we found when we launched our program in 2020 was that our people were, under, were, were responding to the offering of language access where the first question on all of our scripts, no matter what we do, uh, doors and phones and text. The first question is what language do you want to have this conversation in? And we offer 15 languages to make sure that folks know that we care enough about their vote, about earning their vote in order to meet them where they're at in the language they're most comfortable with. And what we found in 2020 was that uh, even folks who were you know, able to have that nuts and bolts voting conversation or that nuts and bolts uh, vote by mail sign up conversation in English, they were staying on the line longer. They were less likely to, ha uh, to hang up. Our contact rate was higher because we led with the question of what language do you want to have that conversation in and communities that are so used to being shut out of the uh, political system, uh, out of voting, out of our democracy, were for the first time ever in Pennsylvania feeling that care and feeling that intention. The other issue is just quite frankly, you know, our uh, movement infrastructure has been so heavily concentrated for so long because of uh, resource allocation because we weren't large enough for folks, uh, for politicians uh, to want to exploit our community for our votes and pander to us uh, in a way that we are now where we're the margin of victory in Pennsylvania. Um, all of that infrastructure, all of our organizations uh, were and continue to be 501c3 and nonpartisan. But all the, the first question and the last question that they always get when they're being registered to vote, when they're being signed up to vote, uh, when they're being taken to the polls, when our, our community organizations, uh, we call them our, uh, our uncle and auntie organizations, uh, are you know, physically in the polling place, walking them through how to vote, providing that crucial language access. The, the, the question that they're always asking is who should we vote for? And in this gap of uh, the lack of uh, funded infrastructure on our side, telling folks which politicians were gonna stand up and fight for our people in language. We had the Trump campaign running billboards in Chinese in Chinatown saying, hey, vote for Donald Trump. We were uh, having Vietnamese communities getting uh, messages in, in Viet on Facebook saying, hey, vote for Donald Trump. And so what we knew is we couldn't just do language accessible calls. We couldn't just do what, uh, what we did in 2020, where we did in language calls. We did late persuasion to Asian American elders fully in language. Uh, we ran our, you know, our mail, our digital, our ethnic media in four languages. Uh, we ran our phone program in 15, things like that. We actually had it to, uh, we actually had to create a system that was simultaneously educating our people on how to vote, how to register to vote, how to sign up to vote by mail, how to, you know, where to go to vote and things like that, while also telling them who they should be voting for, educating them about the, the candidates, things like that. And that's what led to us creating our Language Access Center, which houses our ability to both serve and receive calls in those 15 different languages, but also a hotline that voters across the state can call into and get education, again, not just on how to register, how to fill out that vote by mail form when they don't speak English, things like that, but also simultaneously being educated on which politicians are going to have our back and which candidates are going to fear monger about our communities and sell us down the river. Thank you. Erica and Cassie, I'll go over to you. Um, how does plan action form relationships in your community, especially for your rural canvas days? Um, that is a that is a really great question um, because that looks different no matter where you are, no matter what your organization is. Um, and and uh, real quick, I wanted to do a shout out to our uh, plan action champion, legislative champion Cecilia Gonzalez. So excited to have you on this call with us. Um, but <laughs> at plan action, we know that like 
when it comes to relationship building, especially in, in communities that we're reaching out to the first time, what matters most is consistency and authenticity. We know that when we are talking to people that we have never contacted before and in rural areas of our state, we need to have the ability to follow up with them and create that relationship post that one door knock, that one phone call, that one digital ad they ever saw. Um, we know that we need to have the infrastructure in place to follow up on those commitments and those relationships. Um, and in, in Nevada, being a purple state, we see such an influx of parachute organizations. You know, because we are a year round C3 and C4, we have what it takes and the programs and the organizers and the committed, um, you know, the, the committed urgency to reach out to these communities again and foster that relationship over, over not just this cycle, but many, many cycles from now. Um, and then authenticity. Um, if you know anything about Nevada rural uh, areas, I guess you should know that uh, it's not, um, rural Nevada means having to drive five hours to your nearest hospital, it means not having access to broadband, um, not having access to a dentist or a therapist. Um, and so we know when we talk to these, we're, when we're in rural communities, we need to be as authentic as possible, recognizing that there are systemic barriers to their access to health, to their access to um, many, many services. Um, and so we need to talk about that first uh, before we attach it to any candidate. So we're taking a primarily issue first, candidate second approach with all of our campaigns this year, not only just in our um, rural communities, but, but in our, our main hubs as well. Um, because it's been a long few years um, for all of us, no matter where you live. Um, and so we want to really talk to people about what, what issues they're facing, what solutions they want to see, um, and how plan action could be a help. Um, and that is exactly the approach that we're taking in our rurals, you know, complemented with um, some door knocking, some um, weekend trips, um, as well as, you know, of course, all of the fun tactics like uh, mail and radio. <laughs> um, but we know at the end of the day, it's, it's consistency and authenticity. Um, and that is, you know, what we're, what we're working to try out this year. This will be a first time for us in these communities. Um, so we're very excited about it. And thank you for having us on today. Thank you. Cynthia, um, over to you. What programs have you found to be the most impactful in rural North Carolina communities? Um, and maybe share what is something new you are trying this year? Well, as um, I mentioned earlier, I'm working in rural North Carolina and it sounds like rural Nevada is very similar. <laughs> So I would probably say nothing very different. Um, you know, as I briefly mentioned in my introduction, um, Helen Pulse Mills and I and the organization we started, we started our programs not focused on voter registration and electoral things, but on health inequities, focused on increasing vaccination in rural areas and not those voting things. Those get out the vaccine community events allowed us to work with community partners that cared about the outcomes of the same people we knew were being overlooked and were civically disengaged. It also let the communities know that we care about them beyond a vote. And similar to Plan Action, our organization knows that that work doesn't start and end three or four months before an election. It means you're in the community every single day, 365 days a year. And that's what we plan to, to do. And one of the things that we always talk about with our organization is it begins and ends with listening. Everything that we do begins with hearing their voices and making sure that we're amplifying them, not us. And so one of the newer things that we're doing based on some of the alarming voter number turnout um, rates that I mentioned earlier with black um, men under 40, 35 to 40% um, turnout rates and the natural fraternity we saw occurred when we had 15 black men on a Zoom during a fall 2021 focus group. That made sure that a significant portion of our 22 work is going to focus on re-engaging under 40 African-American male voters. So to, to do that, we've launched our Barbershop Conversation Series, which is named Fade, Fruitful African-American Discussions on Empowerment. And it got that name by a talented 20-something-year-old Black man. And we always want to make sure that our work is centered on the folks we're trying to impact. I don't think any of us in that organization could have come up with that name, but someone so deeply rooted in the community. And so in March, we've launched two um, programs, um, FAE programs in two of our counties, and they include a four-week series of weekly conversations inside of an actual barbershop with Black men from the community 
those infrequently engaged voters, as well as those who are real deeply rooted, but also they're connected with African American male elected officials and community leaders. We focus on some of the top issues and concerns that these black men have said and that connection to their local government. We focus on topics like jobs and wages, crime and the judicial system, entrepreneurship. Out of only our first two FAID programs, we've had one group of men launch their own civic engagement effort. That was after four weeks in the barbershop. We've also had men get elected to county boards who never even knew that this was an option until they walked into a barbershop conversation. And importantly, we've moved people to vote in the May primary and pledged to hashtag arrive with five in future elections. We're excited about building these civic ambassadors from county to county. We know these barbers are the ones that these 18 to 40 year olds see every day in their normal course of business. So we're meeting them where they are. So we'll be arming those barbers with the information needed so that their customers know how to vote, when to vote, how to register to vote. And we know that the result of programs like this will mean that their voices are going to be heard and we're going to reach thousands that are going to impact the 22 election cycle for the U.S. Senate. So that Chief Justice that I mentioned earlier is now our U.S. Senate candidate on the Democratic side who lost that race last year, two years ago by 401 votes. This work can impact that race. This work can impact critical North Carolina General Assembly races. North Carolina is one of the last places in the Southeast where women will have free, a little freer access to abortion. And so we know how important it is to hold on to the North Carolina General Assembly, at least hold on to uh, making sure that we don't become a super minority. And then we know that this work is going to impact local elections, but not only from 2022, but laying a path for 2024 and beyond, including up to 2030. Thank you. Uh, Misa and Lorraine, I'll go over to you. Um, you talked a little bit about how the matriarch organizing program was developed, but could you maybe share a little bit more about that process and how um, you know you brought in community input um, in that in that creation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in 2020, uh, the communities on sovereign lands were hit harder by COVID than any other community. Most of those communities went into shutdown. We couldn't go door to door. We couldn't reach folks that by the typical methods we would reach them. And so we brought on board with Lorraine Coyne, Joanne Pashlakai, and a handful of other very skilled matriarchs who speak the languages of the communities they were serving. Um, a phone bank. And that phone bank was for mutual aid. We provided uh, tons of PPE, access to food and water, and built real relationships with our communities. And we let folks know that if the current situation we were in was not un unacceptable to them, that their vote was their power to make changes. And in Arizona, we did make those changes. And we're seeing these changes being made on a grand scale um, with the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland. Two of our state legislatures, our legislators um, who are indigenous are now working with the Biden administration. And the reason that, that the folks heard our advice was because we were talking to matriarchs. We were talking to women who would say, hey, I had this phone call today. And we were told that um, you know, we can get food here and that's great. But if this is something we want to change, we need to go to the polls and we need to go to polls together. And so we really focused on having women help sign up their entire families to vote by mail. In one of the counties we served, we saw a 300% increase in mail-in ballots in the communities that we were calling into. We knew in 2020 that the key to winning elections in the state of Arizona were matriarchs on sovereign land. Um, and so we wanted to formalize that work that we began and we started the Family Votes Matriarchs program. Uh, to get the program started, we reached out to the women we had been working with since 2018, skilled organizers. Uh, Lorraine nearly has nearly doubled the voter turnout on Hopi sovereign lands in the six years that she's been organizing. And she knows her community better than anyone else. And I'm going to turn it over to Lorraine to explain a little bit more about the program. Thank you. Um, I'm going to probably be going in and out because of the reception. I'm so remote out here. Um, as Misa stated, you know, the COVID really hit us 
all our villages were on lockdown. We had mesas, first mesa, third mesa, second mesa. Um, if we weren't from a particular village, if you weren't a resident of that village, you weren't even allowed to go into that village. We had security guards at the entrances to our villages. So the only way that I could reach people was through through phone. And, you know, just going out and knowing how many people that I knew, and that was quite a bit, and help, having my volunteers help me. And there was one girl that was, uh, you know, I would have to say that she practically knew everybody on the reservation, and her name is Denise. She was a great help reaching out. So between her and I, we reached out and, you know, encouraged our people to, you know, come out and vote and by mail. So we did. And, you know, it was hard. It was very hard because people were afraid. But we were able to somehow get everybody out there to vote. And like I said, you know, um, we talked and we talk and we talk and we talk until they don't want to hear us no more so okay i'll go vote and then some of them didn't have the um, transportation to go vote so um i would go out there and pick them up and i'll say i'll take you to the polling place and the nearest polling place this year um you know is at Kirotsmobi, which is seven miles away from us so I would um, transport them there using all precautions. So um, it was really hard, but you know, getting the word out by telephone and reaching all these, um, especially the matriarch of the families, we were able to pull it. And I'm very proud that we were able to get a lot of people to vote here on Hopi. And I know that there was a lot of, um, Native ladies, you know, within the tribes, our sovereign tribes that did the same kind of job. That's why we were able to turn Arizona blue. So, Asquilly. Lorraine has already recruited a matriarch for every village on Hopi who is working in every community right now to register voters in that community through extended families, clans, and kinships. All told, we're at very nearly 30 matriarchs doing the work in the field today. Um, and every family member that they register to vote um, gets a vote tripling postcard. So we're going to help remind them to bring friends with them to the polls in November too. We worked in one on a four vote per precinct margin in 2020. And we know that turnout for Democrats is always uh, typically lower than Republicans in midterms. So we know that we need to really lean on our families and communities to get the vote out to keep Arizona blue and hold that Senate and House majority. Thank you both. Um, Cecilia, I'm going to go over to you um, and ask about how your campaign and yourself has worked with grassroots organizations like Plan Action. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how this kind of work and partnership has been important to your campaign? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for me as a legislator, it's a little different um, because I started as a community organizer. Um, Plan Action is real is actually the first time I ever uh, went to the state capitol back in, oh my gosh, I think it was like 2015 or 2013. Um, and so for me, I feel that it was really the the um, experiences with these organizations that motivated me and inspired me and propelled me to run for office um and what was your other question i apologize just the to ask about the work um and the partnership that you have had maybe since uh, becoming an assemblywoman what is that yeah like? yeah so um i've definitely partnered with um different organ local community organizations on bills um, and for me, I primarily like to have those folks present the bills if they're comfortable or if they're um, wanting to. And I also try my best to make sure to include them before making any decisions when it comes to stakeholders or other entities that may be interested in the bill or working on the bill as well. And I really feel that 
any way that I can be supportive as a legislator in, in their role for our community, I try my best to do as well um, because they're all doing great work. And I think that the work for me just looks a little different now going from, you know, once being on the outside of the legislature to now being on the inside that I think um, I'm still navigating, honestly. Um, and um, again, I just try to make sure I provide folks with information that maybe as people on the outside, we didn't know, right? Um, so, you know, if that's calming folks down and being like, okay, we're, you know, this was one conversation that was had and now we're gonna move to this or this is the plan or this is the strategy. Um, you know, as an outside person, you don't always get to have or see or know that knowledge. Um, so just being the gap for the community um, and just trying to get folks involved in the legislative process as well, I think is something that all of us on this call are very passionate about. Um, and so I try to do that as well and look forward to um, getting folks more involved. Thank you all so, so much um, for sharing tonight. Um, it's been great to um, discuss your work um, and to just, just to hear an update of, of all your amazing programs. Um, unfortunately, we are a little short on time, so I am not um, able to uh, take any audience questions. Um, but if you do have a question that wasn't answered tonight through the Q&A, um, I highly encourage you to email info at turnoutpack.org. Um, and to, if you'd like to connect directly uh, with one of our fantastic grantee organizations or candidates that we highlighted tonight, I know their links are in the chat. So I highly encourage you to check in there for um, additional information about turnout um, progressive turnout project or any of our grantees. Um, I just want to take a final minute to thank um, everyone uh, for attending tonight. Um, your support of progressive turnout project makes uh, programs like turnout grants possible. Um, I want to thank you always for your continued engagement and support. Um, we are going to have more webinars and opportunities coming up this fall. So please check back on our website, our social media, and our mobilize page uh, for those. Um, and then again, as I said, if you have any questions for our grantees, uh, please uh, reach out to them directly. Um, and then, of course, a final thank you to our fantastic speakers and special guests, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes and Assemblywoman Gonzalez. I so appreciate you all taking the time to join us this evening for such an engaging and inspiring conversation. Um, we're really excited to work with you all more this year. And again, just thank you, everyone. We appreciate you spending tonight with us um, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.